So it's, it's my greatest pleasure right now to host Laura here for the Tree of Life seminar that also happens to be a plenary talk of the Tree of Sex conference because, you know, two plus oh, one plus one can be three sometimes. <laughs> Laura uh, does all this strange organismal biology of studying the most bizarre genetic system and uh, Mark was actually in the need of inviting her and tell us about all the weird things she works on for a really long time. So uh, it's been really long overdue because, you know, weird is what we like in the Tree of Life. <laughs> and uh, I also happened to work with Laura for a few years. And uh, besides the things she used to work a long time ago, Mealybox, she's really good in picking up new systems. So more lately, she was working with springtails and fungus nuts and, you know, she so emerges in this new systems that she can give a full plenary just about those other things. So I actually think we could take a tiny bit of inspiration in that. And perhaps you can also pick up a second less studied system. <laughs> and uh, I guess with this, I will leave the floor to you, Laura. Thank you for coming. <laughs> All right, thanks so much, everyone. And thanks so much to Camel and Mark for inviting me to, to come and give a seminar here and for being able to sort of also accommodate, accommodate my request to sort of squeeze it all in one week. I really, really appreciate that was possible. Um, I also, before I start talking about my own work, just want to say again how amazing and happy I am about the sort of Tree of Sex reboot. I was part of the first Tree of Sex working group. It was an absolutely amazing experience as a first year postdoc at the time. It really shaped my career in, in many, many different ways. Um, yeah, and it's just great to, to see it kind of come back to life. Uh, it's really exciting. Right, so back to sort of the, the work that I do uh, in my lab. So what I will talk about today is the evolution of unusual sex chromosomes and germline restricted chromosomes in a fly. This is not Drosophila, it's a more interesting fly. I hope you'll agree with me at the end of this talk. Um, <laughs> I think the audience here is probably an easy, easy, comfortable, <laughs> easy to, to convince. Um, so what I want to just talk about a bit today is sort of what we do in our lab, in my lab. Um, and we really are interested in animal reproduction and animal sort of genetic inheritance. That's when I talk about reproduction, that's what, a, what I tend to talk about. Um, and I think we have this standard view of how sort of uh, inheritance works in most organisms. Um, most animals especially, but actually, you know, when you go out and look across the diversity of life, there's many systems that are very different from the sort of standard uh, animal kind of reproduction that most people would think about. And quite a few of these unusual reproductive systems um, involve basically strategy, involve sort of the elimination of particular chromosomes or particular parts of the genome as part of the life cycle. So this isn't the sort of drive systems that people talk about sometimes where um, elimination only happens in some organisms, some individuals in the population and not others. No, this is where having sort of the elimination of DNA is like an integral part of the life cycle of these organisms. And this is something that has evolved quite a lot of times in very diverse organisms. And for a very nice kind of overview of some of these systems, I really recommend this review by uh, Dima who's currently in Prague uh, with Carol. So let's sort of introduce these uh, DNA elimination systems a little bit more. So there's an incredible variety, but I kind of like to divide them into two groups just to sort of give you a bit of a, an overview. So this sort of DNA elimination from somatic cells is the first sort of easy to categorize system. And this is something that Alex already talked about. So this is a, a, a system where the embryo starts with a complete set of all chromosomes. And then during sort of the split between um, germline and soma, all cells that become the soma lose a part of this germline genome. So that uh, somatic cells have a significantly smaller genome than germline cells. And this is something we know now has evolved lots of different times and lots of very diverse clades of groups. So I'm sure you've all heard Mark talking about these phenomena in nematodes, um, which sort of lose genomic regions, so they chop up their chromosomes and lose genomic regions. And then there's also this other group, the, these other groups, uh, including the birds that Alex talked about, that lose entire 
chromosomes in this process. And our flies are here as well. So I'll talk about that in a lot more detail later. Then the other type of DNA elimination is kind of the opposite. So this is where DNA elimination mostly happens from germline cells, not from somatic cells. So this affects which part of the genome is, eliminate, is inherited. So um, only part of the sort of entire genome of a diploid organism tends to be passed on to the next generation to the germline. And this again, there's sort of a variety of systems that do this, but probably the most uh, striking examples of this and most kind of frequently and most commonly evolved is this system called paternal genome elimination. So this is a reproductive system where males and females have to mate in order to reproduce and all offspring are sexual, uh, so all offspring are diploid and have chromosomes from both their parents. And when females make gametes, everything is normal. You get recombination between the chromosomes um, when males make gametes, something goes very wrong <laughs> or is very different. Basically, males only ever include the, the chromosomes that they got from their mothers into their sperm. So they have chromosomes from both parents, but they only ever include their mother's chromosomes in their sperm. This is not just a weird like niche phenomena. This has evolved at least seven times in tens of thousands of species. I would say probably hundreds of thousands of species. Uh, once you really start doing the counting in whole orders, such as the spring tool order that Camo works on a lot. You might have uh, heard me talk this meeting about head lice and body lice, human lice, they do this. Uh, mealybugs, which are kind of common plant parasites, do this. So you probably will have, you know, at least these guys uh, in your house, you know, and they have paternal genome elimination. It's very common. And in many of these cases, it's tens of thousands of species per clade that all do this. But before I kind of start actually showing you some of the work that I will be doing, I will be talking about. So we have worked on almost all the different PGE clades. At least we have done at least some projects on them because I like to kind of spread and do everything, which might or might not be a good idea. Um, but today I really want to focus on sort of our um, one of our two main models. So we have mealybugs and then our flies. Um, and before I kind of show you the data, I really want to kind of highlight that this work was really started uh, and led by two incredibly talented former and current PhD student, Christina, who first brought this to my lab, and um, Rob, who has been kind of continuing this work, uh, and they really have made this happen. Right, so study organisms. So what are we talking about is a clade of lower diptera. Uh, Scaridae, or also called black-winged fungus nets, although I'll call them just fungus nets to sort of make it a bit shorter. They're a really great group to work on in the lab because you can keep them pretty much like you could keep Drosophila. So they're very easy to keep in sort of fly piles. They have fairly short generation time. Um, there's lots of different species. And we've actually known already since the 19, early 19, for since the 1920s, that these flies have very, very unusual chromosome biology. So they have, um, uh, they have basically, uh, so I've introduced these sort of these germline elimination and somatic elimination phenomena. In this group, actually, you find both, which is quite unique. Uh, so we can study kind of both these processes in just a single model. And yeah, as a lot of, as I said, a lot of the sort of basic biology of the chromosome behavior was, was you know, we've known for, a hundred years now, and yet very few people have actually worked on this system since. We also still have the original lines that Charles Metz um, collected. We still work on those. We have them here. <laughs> I know, we have them here too. Yeah, so we have the original lines um, and a lot of the sort of uh, phenotypic markers that he kind of developed, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really great. Right, so just to give you a bit of phylogenetic context, fungus nets are so part of this clade of lower flies, um, the Scaridae are here. What is kind of interesting is that there's also this second group in this clade, Cessidomyids, which are um, also have paternal gene emulation and also have germline restricted chromosomes. But there's lots of species, groups in between, families in between that don't. Um, so that's always been kind of very kind of interesting coincidence to me. And yeah, what I said, basically, both of these systems have very unique chromosome biology with um, these germline restricted chromosomes, as Alex already kind of introduced uh, for the birds, we have those, and also very 
unusual sex chromosome evolution. So in this talk, I kind of want to show you some of the work we've done to try to understand how the evolution of this elimination of the paternal genome from sperm is interacted with the evolution of sex determination and sex chromosome evolution, and also the evolution of these germline restricted chromosomes. So those are, will be the sort of two parts of my talk today. So just to sort of show you again what paternal genome elimination looks like, um, basically what I haven't told you anything about yet is how sex determination works in these systems, right? So both sexes are completely diploid. Both sexes, in fact, have an identical genome, at least early on. So how does sex determination work in these systems? We know that in all cases where paternal genome elimination emerged, um, other, other, group, other species in that same clade are um, XY or XO, so we fairly sure that it initially sort of evolved from male heterochromity. But PGE and male and sort of standard sort of male heterochromity aren't really compatible. And the reason is, is that, you know, think of a normal sort of XO male making sperm, it will, half its sperm will be X bearing, the other half will not have the X. But if this male became PGE, it would only ever pass on its maternal chromosomes, which in this case would always be an X chromosome. Um, because the X in a male always came from their mother. So this male would always pass on all their X's to their sperm, always X's to so all the sperm that this male produces would be X bearing. Um, so you would get basically a very strong female bias up to a point where PGE could never really kind of fix in the population um, unless you would evolve a new sex determining system. Yet, we see that actually in several of these clades, so the, the the fungus gnats, the sesodomyids, and the springtails that Camel works on, um, all of these groups still have, actually do still have XO karyotypes, at least when you look at adults. So, you know, how does sex determination and sex chromosome evolution sort of change during this transition from diploidy to, to PGE? Um, we've kind of looked at this in multiple ways, but the first sort of, the first sort of thing we have done is in collaboration with um, Scott Roy, who was at uh, San Francisco State University and one of his PhD students, we actually sort of did like a big phylogenomic analysis where we got fairly like low quality genomes from a lot of these uh, families from fungus gnats, from sesodomyids, so the two PGE clades, and then a whole bunch of in, in between. And saw so just, you know, how does the genome structure change and how does the X chromosome change during these transitions? And what was quite remarkable, and sorry, this is going to be very difficult to see for a lot of you there, um, but I'll sort of talk you through it. So this is the genome X content, so the part of the genome that is X linked. In these intermediate systems, it's very low, it's less than a percent, which suggested that probably have so homomorphic sex chromosomes, probably with a small, very small Y-linked, like Y-specific region. But in these systems, we get incredibly large um, X linkage. So we've lost the Y chromosome, and in both these cases, we have, in some cases, up to 66% of the genome becomes X-linked, and almost all of it is like at least 20, 30, 40%. And what we also look at when we kind of look at it more closer, closely, how the sort of Muller elements that we know are generally pretty conserved in flies, how they change, what we basically see is that we kind of get a lot of bits that are normally would be on autosomes have all moved onto the X chromosome in these groups. Um, and that happened independently in both the Sciaridae and the Sesodomyidae. Um, and interestingly, when we look at this other transition to, to PGE that has a, still has an X chromosome, the springtails, and this is work by Camel. Um, so this is a diploid, normal, uh, you know, Mendelian diploid a springtail. This is a LACMA, which is a PGE species it has almost doubled the part of the genome that's become X-linked because they now have a second X chromosome that co-segregates with the ancestral X. So we see this massive increase in X chromosome size repeatedly over these origins, um, big changes in genome architecture. So uh, why? <laughs> um, this really puzzles, has puzzled us for quite a while. Um, we don't, I, to be honest, I think my main answer is we don't really know for certain why this happens, but one possible hypothesis actually came from David Hake's um, theory work in the 1990s, where he sort of made a model for the evolution of paternal genome elimination in these systems. And his idea was that basically maybe paternal genome elimination initially started as X chromosome drive, 
and then parts of the genome get moved onto the X chromosome or segregated with the X chromosome to benefit from this drive. So you got sort of a hitchhiking effect. Um, if this is really what, what we see, I don't know, but I think it's, it's kind of an interesting, um, an interesting suggestion. And it's definitely, I think, uh, an interesting kind of observation that, you know, if you are sequencing a group and you suddenly see this really big change in X chromosome structure with lots of rearrangement, things moving onto the X, might be worth kind of checking if they maybe do have unusual um, chromosome inheritance as well. Right, so until now I sort of talked to you about, you know, X chromosomes in species where I've already kind of told you that X couldn't really be, standard X chromosome in inheritance couldn't really be the sex determining system because it wouldn't be compatible. So how does that work? Um, so if you look at fungus gnats, if you take a male, a male, an adult male and a female, and you count chromosomes, they indeed have two X's in the female and one X in the male. So everything looks very normal, but that's actually not the whole story. It's only like a tiny part of the story, because actually what happens is that if you look in early developing embryos, um, you see these cells that are dividing and leaving these big chromosomes on the metaphase plate. They're eliminating whole chromosomes. And basically what happens is that um, actually when you look at zygotes, so very early zygotes, all offspring have the same number of X chromosomes. They have one X that they got from their mother. They have two X chromosomes that they got from their, spot, their father. That's because males, although they're XO, make sperm that is deployed for the X because of a non-disjunction. So they have two identical copies of the X chromosome leading to sort of triploid X sperm. And then depending on the sex in embryos meant to become females, they eliminate one of the paternal X's. In those that are, that are becoming males, they eliminate two of the paternal X's. So sex is determined through X elimination. And this sort of over, seems to override the ancestral sort of X eliminate the X um, linked sex determination. And this happens very early on, so at the sort of seven to ninth cleavage division. So that tells you something about the sex determination mechanism, but not really, you know, what drives this then? Because all offspring are, you know, in most systems with genetic sex determination is, you know, how many sex chromosomes do you inherit that determines your sex? Here, all embryos inherit the same number of uh, X chromosomes. So, you know, what makes one a male and what makes the other a female, right? That's quite unclear, but we actually do know a bit about this mechanism in at least some of the fungus nets. And this comes from work by initially Charles Matt and then taken over by Helen Krauss in the 1970s. And basically, in our main lab model, Bradicia coprophila, what we find is that there's actually two different types of X chromosomes. The normal wild type X, and then the, what we call the X prime, which um, is an X chromosome that has this massive inversion on it that spans most of the left arm of the X chromosome. And those individuals, those females that are heterozygous for this inversion, only produce female offspring half of which inherit this uh, inversion and therefore become female producers themselves, half of which don't inherit this inversion. And those ones without the inversion, the other type of female, are exclusively male producers. So we kind of gone from a, a sort of sex determination through what chromosomes an embryo has to sex determination determined by, by what chromosome constitution a mother has. That determines the, the sex ratio of her offspring. So it's maternal genetic sex determination. That's how I quite like to sort of call it. But um, if people don't agree with me, I'm, I'm happy to hear. Right, so we have this large inversion that seems to be involved in sex determination at the maternal level. Uh, one of the things we're kind of interested in is this, did this new sex determination actually co-evolve with the base of paternal genome elimination? So we know paternal genome elimination is very old and conserved in this group about 50 million years ago. Uh, so, you know, is this, is this shared between all of those? That was kind of the first question that we wanted to ask and was kind of the start of um, Rob's, Rob, Robert Baird's, my current PhD student's project. So he generated, we had no genetic information about this system uh, at all. We had, at the time, uh, just when we started this work, the, um, another group was working on a reference male genome. And we've worked, um, so we had that referenced male genome at some point 
um, during this process. And then we generated Illumina short read back bio and high C reads as well for uh, these gynogenic females, so the females that are heterozygous for this inversion. And doing with a lot of sort of work doing the analysis, um, Rob was actually able to um, mostly assemble this inversion. It's still not perfect because we use the old technology back bio, so we still need to improve it. But we managed to kind of pull out about a 55 MB region that we're fairly sure is part of this inversion. Uh, we can also see the inversion breakpoints on the high C map. And this is coverage data. So basically, um, this is a male. So this is the X chromosome at half coverage. Uh, this is the X chromosome in double coverage in a normal, normal, in a male producing female and in a female producing female, it drops off here. And we have this bit, large bit that is exclusive to the inversion. So that's sort of how we uh, pulled it out. And we've now estimated that the age of this inversion is about, it's very, very young. It's about a quarter million years old. That's sort of our best estimate of the age of the system. And we know that PG and fungus nets evolved about 50 million years ago. So I think we can be fairly sure that at least this inversion probably doesn't date back to the origin of um, the origin of the fungus nets. And we actually know that maternal, that this type of maternal sex determination is widespread both in the fungus net, but also in the sesodomyids, but it's absolutely not fixed. It seems to be popping up all the way through and lots of other individuals in both plates uh, produce mixed broods. We don't know how they do it, but they do produce mixed broods. So, you know, we have this very sort of dynamic turnover system and sex determination in this clade. So the other thing that we were kind of interested in then was to look at, you know, we now have this big sort of X-linked inversion, right? We know roughly the age. Can we start looking at the sort of same patterns that people are looking at on, for example, um, you know, differentiating XY chromosomes? So do we see signs of degeneration in terms of loss of genes and also the accumulation of repetitive DNA? So that was something that we wanted to look at in this system as well. So as I said, um, you know, often when we do see sort of the, the differentiation between sex chromosomes, um, it's often started by, you know, associated with having these inversions, which we assume to be largely non-recombining, um, we start seeing divergence between them. And we do see that in this system. So this is, the proper, this is basically the level of divergence between the X and the X prime. So non-divergence at all on the two bits that are still shared. And then we see it in the inversion. But you do see that there's definitely some pattern of, it's not homogeneous. There do seem to be different levels of divergence. So this could be evidence that we might also have some evolutionary strata in this system. Um, Possibly this large inversion is actually more complex. It might have, you know, it might be multiple independent inversions that have been captured in, in a large one. Um, that's something we, um, we don't 100% know yet. And having a slightly better assembly of this region will, I think, help a lot. And Camel is currently sequencing one of another uh, female producer for us. So that will be really nice to see that. How am I doing for time? Cool. So we also looked then at more sort of other estimates of non, of, um, degeneration. Uh, so this is basically a number of genes that are expressed, sort of homologues that are either on the X or the X prime. And we see a significantly lower expression of the homologues that are X prime linked. So and overall, we see that about 8% of genes on this region are either um, disrupted or silenced or both. So yeah, we see still, we see clear signature of degeneration. It's not very far but definitely degeneration. What we don't see, which I find really puzzling, we see absolutely no evidence of transposable element accumulation. So this is the transposable element landscape of the X chromosome. This is of the X prime, so just the inversion here. And it looks almost identical. We've, we've, we've quantified it, there's no change. There really isn't any change. And I think normally people think that you know, the accumulation of TEs on non-recombining regions is one of the first things that happens. And that's just, we don't see it. And my kind of best guess for this is maybe this is a female exclusive region. It's only in females. It's only part, it's only found in a quarter of the population. So it should have a very low effective population side, but only female. Maybe TEs jump less 
in the female germline than in the male germline. That's my best guess. But again, that's something I would like to actually test uh, by looking at TE insertion rates through the sexes at some point. Also, until now, I've been talking to you a lot about how, you know, a large inversion shouldn't recombine anymore. Well, <laughs> maybe it does occasionally. So we have, as I said, these really nice phenotypic markers in this system that have been, you know, first developed very, like 100 years ago in many cases. So we have all these wing mutations that are either on the X prime or on the X. So we can track looking at a female, we know which type of female she is. Uh, and Anne Karenbrook, who is also maintaining the same stocks at the Weishaupt Institute, emailed us at some point and said, you know what, I've seen a weird reversal. I suddenly see these, see these, fly, these flies that should be male producers starting to produce females and you know, vice versa. And she did a whole bunch of crosses. She did also some beautiful cytology on polythene chromosomes. So in, a normal, um, in these normal uh, female producers, you see basically, these are the polythene chromosomes. If you look at them, you see the sort of gap in between, which is a really nice way of actually seeing a large inversion. These chromosomes don't like fully like um, yeah, you, you can sort of distinguish them. So basically show that there's no, there's no pairing really between. But actually in these, this new stock that she found, we actually see a much smaller portion that seems to have a, that looks like the inversion is only a very small portion of the X rather than most of the X, which was curious. So we actually decided to sequence them. And it's exactly what we showed, what, what, what kind of I suspected based on this. So the inversion is very long, spanning most of the X chromosome in our standard systems, in our standard female producers. But now we actually have this female producer, which only has a small portion of the inversion left. So it looks like there has been an, um, a recombination event in the lab between the X and the X prime, which means we now, we now have a stock, which still are female producers, mostly, it's not 100%, that have a much smaller inversion which is going to be great for trying to figure out sex determining mechanisms because having 5,000 genes versus like far fewer helps a lot. <laughs> so we're very excited about this. Um, so that's definitely something we're following up. But it does make the whole kind of idea, estimates of age and degeneration all a bit more complicated because clearly the recommendation in these large inverted regions can happen. Right, how am I doing? Okay. So first, the next part of the talk, I just want to kind of fo focus a little bit more on how um, we think that this model is, this system is a really good model for sex chromosome evolution more broadly outside of this one kind of model species that we've been working on. So as I already said, we have this, what we call monogenic, so single sex brute sex termination system, uh, but we also have these mixed sex brutes. And this is, this is like a very sort of preliminary tree we, we made from, you know, some of the, the, the um, genetic data we have, but basically we see that it's scattered all over, all over the tree. It seems to turn over really fast. Um, and there's even systems where it's mixed. So some of females in the population produce single sex, other produce mixed sex brutes. So that's a really cool f feature to sort of look at these repeated evolution of this monogenic single sex brute sex determination system. It also seems to be associated with inversions multiple times across the tree. So yeah, looking at independent inversions associated with, with these sort of new sex chromosomes, I think it's gonna be really fun, really great to work on. But apart from that, another aspect of the sex determination system and sex chromosome system in this system is that the X chromosomes, the way we expect the X chromosomes to evolve is quite different than in a standard XO or XY system. So normally when people kind of look at patterns like faster X, you always, it's always kind of problematic because um, the X and the autosomes chain are different in terms of their ploidy. So the X is generally hemozygous um, in, in males and um, diploid in females. Um, but also the X and the autosomes change in lots of other ways, right? Are different in lots of other ways. You know, the X chromosome is generally at a lower effective population size in the population because it's only found in one copy in males. It's transmitted more through females than through, more often through females than through males. So there's a lot of confounding factors that can drive differences in rates of evolution between autosomes and X chromosomes. And we've actually done some theory now to show that in this system, actually the only difference across everything we can think of, the only difference between the X and the autosomes is that they have, uh, one is hemizygous, one is um, 
in males and the autosomes are not. Um, so really ploidy should be the only difference that drives any differences in patterns of evolution between X and autosomes. So that's kind of an exciting kind of prediction that makes hopefully some of the analysis a bit easier to kind of interpret than they have been able, than they, have, than are, they are in other organisms. And indeed, when we kind of do some theory on, you know, what does this actually, how, what predictions do we get? So these are, um, this is actually a graph directly lifted from one of Brian's latest uh, reviews on faster X in Drosophila, where the XA ratio uh, of substitution rates here given uh, against dominance. And basically you see that you expect faster X evolution for uh, non-sex non biased or male specific genes in some parts in for recessive alleles, but not for dominant alleles. So it's actually kind of hard to predict, you know, give, if you don't know the dominance of uh, coefficient of a gene, you know, what you expect. But in these PGE systems, actually, we find that we almost always expect faster X evolution across on independence of dominance, which is really quite nice. It makes things very much cleaner. Right, that's a theoretical prediction. <laughs> so we have some really, really preliminary results. This is all graphs that Rob has been sending me in the last few days, one of them in the last hour. So, <laughs> uh, and we haven't gotten all the results yet. But we have some preliminary DNDS ratios of different portions of the genome. So we have this for a gigantic species, a species that has, um, is more simple, that has just a one X and a normal X chromosome in the autosomes, but, we, but I don't have that data quite yet. Um, but this is for our lab system, which is a bit more complicated because it also has that inverted region, right? So the whole system becomes a bit more complicated again. But what we see is that we see the DNDS of autosomes um, and this is the X shared portion. So that's this portion that is sort of shared between the, um, that is on the X, but it's shared between the two different types of females. They do actually not show much difference in um, rate of evolution. So we would have expected always that the X was faster. So we don't really see that here. But we do see evidence of kind of slower X evolution for this bit that is homologous to the inverted region. Uh, so we see Beatrice recently had a paper showing kind of the slower X effect when it's kind of masked by um, a, a, slight, a slightly degenerate Seth Y. That's maybe what we're seeing here. Um, and also when we look at, so this is the NDS, if we look at just synonymous divergence, we do actually see on this region a higher level of uh, neutral evolution. So we probably do see that may be the fact that this is in slightly lower effective population size um, because it's only found in um, it's only found in one type of the female it is maybe why we see slightly higher rates of evolution. So that's kind of it's, it's interesting. So then Rob in the last hour sent me this last graph, which I think maybe kind of unpackaged this 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 sort of slower X effect a little bit more. So actually when we kind of look at the two different types of genes on this X region, the ones that have a functional copy still on the degenerated version versus the ones that don't have a functional part, we actually see that we see faster evolution on uh, those genes that no longer have a functional homolog. Um, so that basis, so that kind of suggests that maybe we are looking at this masking effect. So. Um, this is all very preliminary. We are generating resequencing data to do a more proper analysis of um, evolutionary rates. But I just wanted to show that that's the sort of work that we're currently um, that we're currently focusing on, doing this across um, species with different sex determination systems. So to summarize this all is that um, we know that in this case paternal genome elimination in both the fly clades and in the uh, fungus nets is associated with very large X chromosomes. We see uh, X, you know, X chromosomes aren't strictly involved in sex determination anymore, but their elimination drives sex determination. And in some species, this has become under genetic maternal control by the evolution of these um, maternally acting in supergenes, maternally acting inversions. In those, we see some signatures of degradation, but not TE accumulation for some reason. And basically what we see is that almost each part of the sex chromosome show its own unique pattern of evolution. Um, 
possibly shaped by a combination of uh, effective population size and hemisegosity. And but this is going to require a lot more work to really unpack that in a lot of detail. And I would love suggestions to, for people that are more expert on that part of the uh, analysis. Right, so for the last part of this talk, I kind of going to switch focus a little bit. So until now, I've really only talked about the sort of unusual X um, inheritance of fungus nets and how that evolves, uh, invo how that affects sex chromosome evolution. Now I'll focus on this other mass, these other, this other massive chromosome that they have. So this is this germline restricted chromosome. So it's only found in the germline, not in the somatic cells. And also just again to, to remind you, this is a phenomenon we see in the fungus nets, but also again in this other clay, the Cessinomyidae. And what is really kind of striking is that this germline restricted chromosome behaves like an X chromosome in many, many ways. Uh, this is kind of, it's been always kind of remarkable. So we know that the X chromosomes are eliminated from somatic cells in the seventh to ninth cleavage division. Actually, one or two divisions before that, uh, the germline restricted chromosomes are eliminated in the exact same way. They left on the metaphase plate during cell division. So one of the hypotheses, again, from David Haig, who seems to be the only one that really sort of thought about this, the evolution of this system in a lot of detail, um, he sort of said maybe these germline restricted chromosomes actually evolved from sex chromosomes, from X chromosomes, maybe as a result of conflict over sex determination. The idea here is that under paternal genome elimination, a male that makes a son doesn't get any fitness through that son because his son is going to eliminate all the paternal chromosomes. So a male can father a son, but his son will kick away, kick out all his genome. So you better, better off making a daughter, right? And maybe one way that these males might have tried to make more daughters was by just putting extra X chromosomes in their um, sperm. Because if X happens by X elimination, then maybe that way they can turn some of what would have been XO individuals into um, XX individuals. So like, let's put, just keep on putting more X's in it and see if that works. So that's maybe also why, um, you know, we already see that the X's have the uh, X are deployed for the for the sperm for the X sperm or sperm is deployed for the X sperm is also deployed for the DRCs. Well, uh, oocytes are haploid for both. So, you know, it was a really lovely suggestion, and and I, I kind of truly believe that this might be what was happening. Um, and so Christina, when she sort of during her PhD, we decided it'd be really nice to actually try to generate some data for these germline restricted chromosomes because at the time people were working on a reference genome but it didn't really capture any of the um, germline restricted chromosomes in there. Um, so she did absolutely painstaking dissections of somatic and germline tissue in these tiny, tiny flies and generated lots of sequencing data. Um, and I'm not going to talk very much about the analysis part, um, but um, in the end, she managed to get a nice assembly of um, the GRCs. And actually, one, one of the first things that was really surprising of this results was that 40% of the genome, the 30% of the germline genome is actually made of, of these GRCs. So they're massive. It's almost half the genome. Then when we put these GRC scaffolds against, at the time, we didn't have a full chromosome level assembly. We, now we do. but against the sort of scaffolds they had from the from the reference genome, we saw that they mapped absolutely everywhere. There's absolutely no signal that they might be homologous to the X. So that hypothesis just didn't seem to be true. Um, basically, what it looked like more is that the GRCs were like a diverged extra copy of the genome. But I, but I say diverged because they were really quite different from the rest of the genome. So it looks like the, 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 the germline is polyploid, basically, but it's a very different type to these two genomes. They're not very similar anymore. So how, <laughs> why? Uh, so really the, this, the question became like, where did these DRCs come from? And we already, you know, we were lucky that we already had this um, sort of phylogenomic data from the, the, this X chromosome turnover paper, where we had genomes from um, quite a few individuals from this, uh, across this phylogeny. And we also know that you know, we have these two clades that both have paternal genome elimination and also both have DRCs that are very distantly related. So it's, it's all kind of um, 
yeah, slightly kind of suspicious. And to, to, to like make a very short observation of, about a very sort of large analysis that uh, um, Christina did in, in collaboration with Camel. Basically, when we, when we took homologs um, between, you know, when we identified um, genes, genes in the core genome or, or sort of um, copies of the same gene in, on the GRC and put them in a phylogeny, we saw that the core genome kind of fitted exactly where we would expect it on the phylogeny, right? It, it clustered with the other fungus nets. Good. The GRC copy clustered with right in the middle of that other clade, that other PGE clade, uh, which was incredibly unexpected. And we've tried to break this result in many different ways. Because I really didn't believe it when I first saw it. Um, <laughs> I needed a lot of convincing. But basically, we think that really the best possible explanation for this is that at some point, there was an integration event between these two families. We think that this integration must have happened somewhere in this window, maybe 50 million years ago, after these two plates had split, or maybe at the base of the basically right about here. Um, if this is indeed, you know, true, which we think it is, it would be pretty much the oldest successful hybridization event about us mating with a lemur and having integration of the genome. Um, so yeah, it's very cool. Um, so, <laughs> but we're still very puzzled about it. And yeah, we desperately need, uh, we have currently no DRC data for this other clade. So we don't actually know if it's the core genome that got integrated, or maybe their GRCs, we don't know. We need data from lots more species to see how this kind of pattern holds up when we look at it across many more species. Uh, and there's quite a few of those in the pipeline uh, through camel, through collaboration with camel. So the tree of life is sequencing quite a few more of these, these, these flies. We also, you know, I always get the questions like, so what is, what are these GRCs doing? They're there. They contain many, many genes, thousands and thousands of genes. You know, what are they doing? The question is the, the sort of answer, short answer is we have no clue. Uh, the slightly longer uh, question, the longer answer is we have been looking at, for example, patterns of gene expression. We know they're euchromatic and quite heterochromatic in many developmental stages, but they do decondense and they do seem to be expressed uh, in some stages. Um, and we've done some, we've generated some genome, some uh, gene expression data from germline and soma tissue. Uh, so this is from uh, germline soma tissue during meiosis. So these are lar sorry you can't really see it. These are larval flies. Um, and these are the number of number. This, these are genes with significant expression in females and males, and you see that we see, get lots of autosomal expression, lots of X expression, and almost no DRC expression in sort of this stage of female meiosis uh, in germline tissue. Right. So this is actually dissected out germline tissue, and still we barely see an expression. We also have looked at this in very early embryos, so before the onset of embryonic gene expression. So these are maternally deposited transcripts. Again, we see a couple, but very little. Uh, we need to dig more deeply into which ones they are that are expressed, and that, that's ongoing work. But yeah, so there seems to be some gene expression, but not very much. Um, and this sort of makes me think, so why are these things conserved? Why, why are they still there? And then it becomes really interesting that Although these DRCs are old, they seem to be present in, you know, members of almost all fungus that genera, suddenly in some species, they're lost. The entire chromosomes are lost. Why? No idea. So again, we're trying to sample this species. We had it in the lab briefly and we lost it, but we'll, we'll, we'll get it back. So uh, <laughs> we need to kind of do, do some work on to see, you know, what is their germline expression like and how, you know, trying to figure out what's happened there. Um, I don't know, ongoing work. But yeah, I think sort of to, set, to wrap this up, um, because we're almost at the end of the, 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 the slot, basically, I think I want to sort of show to you that fungus nuts and cystinomyces, other clade, um, are, share a lot of kind of really unusual features all at the same time. So they share paternal genome elimination, they share these these germline stricted chromosomes, they also independently have evolved this, this maternal sex determination through supergenes, lots of different times. 
Um, so yeah, it, it's just a very cool system and no one is working on them almost, you know, there's maybe 10 people in the la in the world and most of them are focusing on um, chromosome, like, you know, um, sort of very hardcore cell biology that doesn't have much to do with any of the unusual chromosome biology. So there's a lot of scope for work and I'm hoping other people will kind of jump, come, come and join us because we need more, we need more hands. Um, <laughs> And, you know, we really don't understand how these all these things relate. So there, of course, is a chance that maybe some of these intermediate families all had this and lost it, possi possibly, but we don't have any clear indication. Or maybe the mechanisms of, for example, DRC elimination were co-opted from the sex determination or the other way around. That's definitely an option. Or even, you know, maybe integration of the molecular machinery of, elim of chromosome elimination then got co-opted into sex determination. This is all incredibly speculative. Um, but I'm hoping I've kind of convinced you that it's a cool system to work on, that the evolution of, of this kind of one type of genome elimination has been accompanied by the evolution of other types of genome elimination. And basically almost each part of the genome has its own pattern of inheritance, tissue specificity, sex linkage, you know, so it's a great system to play around with. And there's also scope for lots of comparative work because we have independent evolution of these or independent in two different clades and extensive within, within clade variability. And a lot of the traits we're interested in, even within species sometimes or between very closely related sister species. To finalize, I think I really, really like this quote that my former advisor, Ben Normark, uh, wrote in a book chapter. If you want to understand the adaptive significance of Mendel's laws, it may be useful to understand the cases where they have been overthrown. And I think this really sums up sort of all my work. Um, and I think the fungus nets are a great system for that. And just to sort of advertise, um, if anyone is solved by my, this is a great system, I am looking for a postdoc to work on the system. Um, the ad is actually closed, but if anyone still has a, a trainee or is interested in themselves, please do get in touch. I can maybe, I can incorporate some late applicants as well. And to, to, I would like to thank all our collaborators on all the different aspects of fungus net genomics. And of course, my lab, mainly my two students or current and former students, and then the two postdocs that were really kind of like instrumental in um, the germ unrestricted uh, chromosome work and also the uh, sex determination work. With that, I would like to take questions. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well. Yeah, thanks for a fasc fascinating talk. Um, so what about sex determination? <laughs> because, yeah. I mean, but, so what you show is that the X uh, chromosomes are eliminated in mm -hmm. cleavage uh, yeah. division six yeah, or yeah. nine or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And then sex determination must have already taken place, yeah. right? Yeah. So, but then they are still identical. They still have all the three X chromosomes, for yeah. instance. So are these uh, to be eliminated X chromosomes already sort of silenced or so? Uh, are they already have uh, some marks on them so they're not expressed? Or something well, like they're that? not, you know? so they're not silenced at this point. They're not, uh, non, nothing is expressed at this point because this is all happening before the onset of embryonic gene expression. So everything is mediated by maternally deposited mRNAs. Um, that's something we know very certain. We also know that the X, so we know a bit from sort of older work. So we know that there is a region on the X, on the non-inverted part of the X, that people call the controlling element. It's a very repetitive region that if you move it by translocation onto an autosome, then the autosome start becoming eliminated. So it clearly is like a controlling element for elimination, or at least it, it, it make yeah, it, it sort of recognizes, okay, this is an X chromosome. Um, our collaborators have managed to sequence this region, but it's just satellite DNA, and we still don't quite know, you know, how it works. But my best guess is maybe mothers are putting some uh, like small RNA or other sort of transcripts that are kind of binding to that region. And maybe those are, um, it seems like basically, it can't be just, you know, paternal versus maternal X, because females also are eliminating a paternal X, but they eliminate one, males eliminate two. So it seems like maybe you need sort of, it's like a dosage effect that if you have a bit of this transcript, 
then you eliminate only, you go to one round of, of X elimination, and if you have two, you go to two rounds of X elimination. So it's two different cell divisions that seem to have one X versus two X eliminated. We are working on it. We have lots of um, early expression data from um, before the onset of embryonic gene expression from the different types of females. Um, we also generating RNA, uh, RNA seq data or um, small RNA data. But yeah, this this inversion is huge. It has thousands of genes on it. So knowing which one is the one is hard. <laughs> so sorry, that was a very long answer. Thank you for a really exciting talk. Thank so. You. So your GRC looks a uh, horizontal gene transfer, not like hybridization of the genome. So do you think this is single event or multiple, single event or multiple events of horizontal gene transfer make that this piece of GRC? Oh, multiple or single. Yeah, I multiple. think it looks like it's probably, it's hard to know where do we need to get more that, that's something we need to get more data for but it looks like it's almost the entire an entire copy of the sesodomyid genome that has become moved into the, a fungus net and become germline restricted but that's kind of as much as we can say i think with like very few species sequenced and so that's sort of what it looks like you know it it yeah that's sort of that is what that is what it, looks, it could you know but how how else apart from hybridization could you have a horizontal gene transfer of like an entire genome we definitely considered that but we still think that even distant hybridization is probably a better better like solution than some you know parasitoid wasp or something like that like for an entire genome. <laughs> and did you see that some repeat elements in the, this GRC that is different? Well, we have a preliminary analysis looking at that. So comparing the, the um, comparing the repeat landscape on the DRCs on, and in the two different plates, and it looks more again it looks more like a Golmich assessment than it looks like a fungus net. But again, our data is really not good enough to be very sure about this. And also, like in fifty million years, wouldn't you know? You would expect that repeat landscapes would change a lot mm -hmm. anyway, right? So. So that I don't really want to read too much into that. It looks kind of promising, but I don't want to read too much into that right now. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thanks. That's very great. Uh, so I have a lot of questions regarding this invasion, no. uh, as you imagine. Uh, just I was wondering if you have found other invasions segregating uh, of the genome. Yeah. And like, are they as big as this one or? Yeah, so yes, we, we, we haven't really looked at it, but when we do look at, um, you know, this is, this is a line that has been inbred for 100 years, so has very, very low homozygosity, we definitely see some peaks of like blocks of increased heterozygosity on other autosomes, we haven't really looked into it, but it looks like they might be inversions, and we're about to get uh, resequencing data, population resequencing data back from multiple species, multiple populations. So we should hopefully be able to look into that. Yeah. I think mostly, you know, flies have inversions everywhere all the time, right? I think that's kind of what people yeah. see. But. And also, I was pretty interested by the fact that like in one trade, there is like restore recombination between like the invert segment and the other one. So that you suggest that there is a recombination event that have restored. And could it be like, instead of a laugh, like a nested inversion within yeah. the first one, which has restore combination of the, the whole part of this chromosome. Well, sorry, I didn't get Like, uh, could it be instead like uh, like just an inversion within the first inversion, which has that restores the gene order, and so the restores yeah. the recombination? I think that might be what we're seeing. Um, it's it's kind of confusing. The, the other sort of what should be the normal wild type male producers also seem to have captured in that line a little bit of the um, a tiny bit of the inversion, and they're no longer 100% milk producers. So again, we're hoping that this might help us map stuff, but so it's really complicated. We don't exactly know what happened, but it happened within sort of a mass culture in the lab. Uh, and luckily, Anne was kind of clever enough to realize like, wait, something. But yeah, so the fact that we can see it in fairly, you know, in lab populations might be that it actually happens all the time um, in the wild, we don't really know. Alex, mm -hmm. can I? 
Great talk, uh, Laura. Thanks so much. I have lots of um, either naive or nerdy questions, but I'll, I'll restrict myself to one that might also just reflect my ignorance um, of insect genomics in yeah. general. But can you come up with a come up with a sex chromosome-like formula for GRCs in these species, and by extension, maybe for for this for this uh, tree of sex initiative also, would it be actually worth? Or maybe this exists already. Would it be worth coming up with a formula thing that implies what is germline versus soma, what is males versus females, what is like paternal versus yeah. GRC eliminated, etc. Is there some way to, for example, here phrase it in a very simple manner that can be easily parsed in a database? Do you have some thoughts on that? No, no. <laughs> so yeah, I, I left quite a bit of detail of the chromosome cycle of, of fungus net out to simplify things. So um, all the sort of X elimination is soma only as well. The germline, male germline is actually XX, not XO. <sighs> like, yes, I, I didn't really mention, but the X, so the, the germline is actually the only element of the genome that isn't paternally eliminated, isn't eliminated when it's paternal. So it actually seems to have a higher rate of true males than true females compared to the rest, the entire rest of the genome. Uh, we don't and, and we don't even really fully understand it because there's some parent of origin specific possibly elimination events in the middle too. So all of spring has actually three GRCs at the beginning and then they eliminate one and we don't know which one. So no, I don't know. I don't even want to start. It never gets out, huh? <laughs> the next question comes from online. Uh, ben Joanne? Who is there? Yeah. Hi. Hi, Laura. Hi, nice to see you. Hi. <laughs> yes, nice to see you. I couldn't come in person. Great talk. That's just wow. So many, so many things to take in. Um, so each time I, I think this second or third time, I'm still trying to understand the, all this complicated, weird system. So uh, maybe I didn't understand fully. I just want to get clear. Uh, so for the, the first part of the talk, you mentioned about this inversion related to this sex determination. That's one uh, gender inversion. When you compare this inversion, uh, so I, do I understand correctly? In a single population, there were two types of females: standard XX females and X with inversion females. Yeah. And what's the frequency of? Do you know, like a, a population data, the frequency of these inverted X X females? Yeah. Uh, so, and my question getting to is because I want to. Uh, I guess you answered the, the you posed the question that oh you you generate this uh, the the TE. Uh, 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 accumulation yeah. on the inversions and you didn't see any whatsoever yeah, yeah. differences. So I was thinking like, okay, yes, you found like a rare recombination. Yeah, that maybe, you know, mm -hmm. it's the majority of them. A second is like, what's the basic frequency of this type of females? That is because it's rather rare. So it's in a way of, uh, you know, maybe doesn't have that big event yeah. uh, the, uh, influence. So we don't know anything about really like natural populations that we hopefully will at some point. But in the lab, in our lab systems, we know it becomes like just a standard sort of Mendelian sex determination system, right? So yeah, yeah. heterozygous female, like half her offspring inherits it, uh, and therefore is female producer of the other half. So it really should be present in a quarter of the population. Um, so yeah, it has a lower effect of population size than the rest of the genome, but not by that much. Um, it's female limited, okay. but not in all females. So um, I think, and it does, at least in this species, supposedly look like it's fixed, also in natural populations, but there is plenty of um, other species, really closely related species, where some individuals in natural populations produce mixed sex brutes and presumably therefore don't have a segregated mm -hmm. inversion, and others do. Um, so uh, there's just a ton of work to do across species to sort of look how this works and even maybe trying to do some experimental evolution uh, in the lab of like, you know, if you have a mixed mixed system, like, you know, when is it more beneficial to have split sex ratio, to have these separate sex ratios versus mixed brutes, you know, is it population mm -hmm. size, for example, um, can, yeah, can we kind of come up, can we kind of start doing some experimental evolution in this system? So that's kind of one of the, the areas where we're going with this. Okay, yeah. Um, can I uh, just quickly uh, uh, ask, so have you looked at into, you have a lot of this expression data from uh, early development into other, have you checking whether there's a dosage compensation in your XO system? Yes, yes we have. <laughs> so uh, we have X autosome dosage, we don't seem to have any uh, inversion that sort of, so that we have in males we have XO dosage, 
conversation. So it, just like in Drosophila, male seems to, um, what is it, upregulate the X. Um, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I can always, I can never remember, but we don't see any sort of dosage compensation for the sort of genes that are lost that are degenerated on the um, inversion Inverted. of females. So we don't see any sort of evolution of of dosage compensation, and I, I can imagine that might be quite difficult because this inversion is not pos not present in all females, only in half of the females. So yeah. yeah, it's it's so it's probably we don't have any evidence for that 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 happens. Um, we are trying to look into the mechanisms of X dosage compensation as well, because it's quite nice when you have single sex brutes, so you can get early embryo, early expression data from very, from known sex embryos, which is kind of hard in many things. Uh, does it make sense? Have you checked if you have this, uh, if there is an inverted X and O is also a male or am I wrong completely? We XO can, can be standard XO and X inverted O. X O with inverted. So if you have an X prime O individual, if they're male or female, um, we do occasionally see like these, like what we call exceptional offspring. So male, in, in, in male brutes, we sometimes see a female and female brutes, we sometimes see a male. Uh, the frequencies are not the same. Um, people have reported um, X prime O individuals. They are indeed male, but they're sterile. <laughs> 